Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. When I first found out there was such a thing as radiation, and that some materials were radioactive, that they could kill you just by looking at them, the idea seemed just plain demonic. How could the world be such a dangerous place with this kind of stuff just laying around? But what scares me also fascinates me. What I'd picked up about radioactive materials was mostly from watching Back to the Future. That those fellows, the Libyans, were interested in plutonium for making bombs. And Doc Brown was interested in the same stuff, but for making time machines out of cars. I found out that the same stuff, plutonium, was used in weapons so powerful that it seemed like science fiction. And that two of them had been dropped on cities in Japan during World War II by my own country. This was before the days of the internet. So I had to pick up the world book or visit the library to learn about the science of radiation. It was in a New Jersey public library that I came across a true story about something called the Demon Core, a haunted piece of plutonium responsible for two fatal accidents and the deaths of two prominent scientists associated with the Manhattan Project, experts with the highest level of familiarity and training with handling radioactive materials. The men died by a flash of light I remember wondering, what is this strange light, this thing, radiation? It took me some time, but it began to make more sense to me. Radioactive materials are going through changes. The nucleus, the deep core of the atom, is in a state of radical flux, struggling to achieve a stable state while releasing bright, dangerous light in the form of X-rays and gamma rays, and even little shards of the nucleus itself. X-rays and gamma rays are light, bluer than blue, bluer than ultraviolet, shorter in wavelength, so blue that our idea of color no longer makes any sense. Radioactive materials sit mostly toward the bottom of the periodic table. They're the heavier atoms, the atoms with the larger nucleus. The larger the nucleus, the more difficult for it to hold together in a stable way. That's why it's difficult for physicists to create new elements all day long. Even the new elements they can make the nuclei tend to fall apart, sending out different kinds of radiation while the element decays to something lighter, something more toward the top of the periodic table. For instance, radium decays to radon and helium. Scientists that deal with radioactive materials to me seemed like the big cat trainers at the zoo. People who knew how to love doing something that could kill them any minute. Many of the deepest insights into radioactive materials came during one large science experiment called the Manhattan Project. The time, during World War II, was both like a horror movie and a scientific renaissance. Many of the country's finest minds came together in one place, in the middle of nowhere, with nothing to distract them, with one goal in mind, to build something basically impossible to build. These guys were the best and the brightest, but the concepts were so new, they were still learning on the job. Los Alamos, New Mexico was chosen by the government for its remote setting and natural beauty. They wanted a place for the staff and their families to be happy without any distractions and far away from any kind of watching or prying eyes. The goal was to build the bomb, to end the war, to cement the U.S. as a superpower on Earth, to change the world. The Manhattan Project was broken into two parts. One consisting of the engineering and fabrication of the device itself, and two, the refinement of the material for the radioactive core. The level of chemical and isotopic purity required for the core of the device made this plutonium the rarest, most expensive material that ever existed on Earth. The purification for the core required a large fraction of the total energy production of the entire United States. But the scientists met their objective the materials were mined and refined, the devices built, and two bombs were dropped over populated cities in Japan, triggering the country's immediate surrender. After the bombings in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki, hundreds of thousands of deaths, the end of the war in the East, and a new age, the U.S. military had one core left, just enough material for one more bomb. The Demon Core like the second core used in the bombing of Nagasaki, was a solid 14-pound sphere measuring roughly 3.5 inches in diameter. It consisted of three parts, two plutonium-gallium hemispheres, 
and a ring designed to keep the neutron flux from jetting out of the surface joined between the two hemispheres. The metallurgists use a plutonium gallium alloy, which stabilized the gamma phase allotrope of plutonium so it could be hot pressed into the desired spherical shape for the core. And as plutonium was found to corrode very easily, the sphere was then coated with a layer of nickel. On August 10th, Major General Leslie R. Groves wrote to the General of the Army, George C. Marshall, also the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, to inform him that the next bomb of the implosion type has been scheduled to be ready for delivery on the target on the first good weather after August 24, 1945. We have gained four days in manufacture and expect to ship the final components from New Mexico on August 12th or 13th. Providing there are no unforeseen difficulties in manufacture, in transportation to the theater, or after arrival in the theater, that's what the, the theater is an interesting word, the bomb should be ready for delivery on the first suitable weather after August 17th or 18th. Marshall added in an annotation, it is not to be released on Japan without the expressed authority from the president as President Harry S. Truman was waiting to see the effects from the first two attacks. It was anticipated to be dropped on August 19th. However, this was preempted by Japan's official surrender on August 15th, 1945. Even after Japan's defeat, the project was still ordered to continue. The scientists moved forward with further testing on the core for a third potential nuclear weapon. On August 21st, 1945, Harry Dalian made a mistake while performing a neutron reflector experiment on the demon core. His goal was to build a wall of special neutron radiation reflective bricks around the core, slowly adding bricks closer to the core until there were enough reflected neutrons to cause a chain reaction, an unimaginable cascade of radiation. While attempting to stack another tungsten carbide brick around the assembly, Dalian accidentally dropped it onto the core and thereby caused the core to go supercritical, resulting in a self-sustaining critical chain reaction. The plutonium core produced a burst of neutron radiation, a shower of high energy nucleus bits hurtling near the speed of light. He quickly moved the brick off the assembly, but still received a fatal dose of radiation. He died 25 days later from radiation poisoning. He was working alone. A security guard, Private Robert J. Hemmerly, was seated at a desk about 12 feet away. He ended up okay. After that, the Demon Corps still wasn't finished. And I can't believe these kinds of experiments weren't outlawed after that accident. If you can believe it, people were still unwilling to take stupid chances with the Demon Corps. Less than a year later, on May 21, 1946, physicist Louis Slotin and seven other trained personnel were in a Los Alamos laboratory conducting another experiment to verify the closeness of the core to criticality by positioning neutron reflectors. Wait, that experiment sounds familiar. Slotin, who was just getting ready to leave Los Alamos, was showing the technique to Alvin C. Graves, who would use it in a final test before the Operation Crossroads nuclear tests scheduled a month later. Louis Slotin's plan was to place the two half spheres of beryllium, like tungsten carbide, a neutron reflector, around the core and manually lower the top reflector over the core using a thumb hole on the top. As the reflectors were manually, manually moved closer and farther away from each other, scintillation counters measured the relative activity from the core. The most important thing was to maintain a slight separation between the reflector halves in order to stay below criticality. The standard safety protocol was to use shims between the halves, because allowing them to come close could result in instantaneous formation of a critical mass and a lethal burst of radiation. Under Slotin's direction, the shims were not used, and the only thing preventing that complete closure was the blade of a standard flat-tipped screwdriver manipulated in Slotin's hand. Slotin had performed this very test on almost a dozen occasions, often in his trademark jeans and cowboy boots, and in front of roomfuls of observers. Legendary physicist Enrico Fermi reportedly, reportedly told Slotin he would be dead within a year if he continued performing the test in that manner. 
Scientists refer to this flirting with the possibility of a nuclear chain reaction as tickling the dragon's tail. Isn't that cute? This was based on a remark by physicist Richard Feynman, who compared the experiments to tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. On the day of the accident, slot and screwdriver slipped out just a fraction of an inch while he was lowering the top reflector, allowing the reflector to fall into place around the core. Instantly, there was a flash of blue, blue light and a wave of heat across Slotin's skin. The core had become supercritical, releasing an intense burst of neutron radiation, estimated to have lasted less than half a second. Ramir Schreiber, who was in the lab at the time, had turned away to focus on other work, expecting that the experiment would be uninteresting until several more moments had passed. But suddenly, he heard a sound behind him. Slotin's screwdriver had slipped and the tamper had dropped fully over the core. When Schreibner turned around, he saw a, a, a flash of blue light and felt a wave of heat on his face. A week later, he wrote a report on the accident. The blue flash was clearly visible in the room, although the room was well illuminated from the windows and the overhead lights. The total duration of the flash could not have been more than a few tenths of a second. Slotten reacted very quickly in flipping the tamper piece off. The time was about 3 p.m. A guard who was stationed in the room to keep an eye on the precious plutonium had little knowledge of what Slotten was doing. But when the core started to glow and people started yelling, he promptly ran out of the door and up a nearby hill. Subsequent calculations put the total number of fission reactions at about three quadrillion, a million times smaller than the first atomic bombs, but still enough to send out a significant burst of radioactivity. This radioactivity excited the electrons in the air, which, as they flipped back into an unexcited state, created the flash of blue light. Slotin quickly twisted his wrist, flipping the top shell onto the floor. The heating of the core and shell stopped the criticality within a second of, it, of, it, of its initiation, while Slotin's reaction prevented a recurrence and ended the accident. The lab was evacuated. As the scientists waited for help to arrive, they tried to work out how much radiation they had received. Slotin made a sketch of where everyone had been standing when the slip occurred. He then tried to use a radiation detector on various items that were near the core, a bristle brush, an empty Coca-Cola bottle, a hammer, a measuring tape. But it proved difficult to get an accurate reading because the detector itself had been heavily damaged and contaminated. Slotin instructed one of his colleagues to lay radioactive, radioactivity detecting film around the area, which required the scientists to go dangerously close to the still, the still overheated core. This, this errand resulted in no useful data, and was mentioned in a later report as evidence that, after an exposure of this magnitude of radiation, human beings are in no condition for rational behavior. There's a great movie about the Manhattan Project called Fat Man and Little Boy, containing this story about the demon core. John Cusack, Lloyd Dobler from the movie Say Anything played Louis Slotin. Dwight Schultz, Howling Mad Murdoch from the original 18 TV show, plays Robert Oppenheimer, the chief scientist of the whole project. The demon core scene in the movie captured the events fairly accurately. How could proper adult scientists be doing something so dangerous? Why would Lloyd Dobler be tickling the dragon's tail and daring the universe to grant him his terrible demise due to radiation sickness? I couldn't believe this movie was accurate in the depiction of that experiment at Los Alamos. What's even nuttier is that basically the same accident happened on two occasions with the same radioactive test core, resulting in deaths in both instances. Scientists were cowboys in those days. We can't even wash our hands without safety glasses in the labs where I've worked. The witnesses to the demonstration were taken to the Los Alamos hospital. Slotin vomited once prior to being examined and several more times in the next few hours, but it, st but it stopped by the following morning. For a little while, his general health seemed to improve. However, his left hand, which had been close to the demon core and had initially been numb and tingling, became increasingly painful. Scientists estimated that his hand had received more than 15,000 Rinkin. 500 Rinkin is usually considered fatal for humans. The hand eventually d took on a waxy blue appearance and then developed large blisters. 
Slotin's physicians kept it packed in ice to limit the swelling and pain. His right hand, which had been holding the screwdriver, suffered lesser versions of these symptoms. Slotin's white blood cell count dropped dramatically. His body temperature and pulse began to repeatedly rise and plummet. From this day on, the patient failed rapidly, the medical report noted. Slotin suffered nausea and abdominal pains and began losing significant weight. He had internal radiation burns, what one medical expert called a three-dimensional sunburn. Within a week of the accident, he was experiencing periods of mental confusion. His lips turned blue and he was put in an oxygen tent. Eventually, he sank into a coma. He died nine days after the accident at the age of 35. After these incidents, the Corps, originally called Rufus, was referred to as the Demon Corps. Hands-on tests were finally stopped. Automation, remote control machines, and cameras were finally implemented to perform such experiments, with all personnel held at a quarter-mile distance. The Demon Corps was intended to be used in Operation Crossroads, but after the second accident, time was needed for its radioactivity to climb to manageable levels. Two new cores were shipped for use in the Abel and Baker tests, and the Demon Corps was scheduled to be shipped later for the third test of the series, provisionally named Charlie. But that was canceled due to the alarming and dangerous level of radioactivity resulting from the underwater Baker test. The Demon Corps was eventually melted down, and the material recycled and cast into a new generation of nuclear cores, becoming part of many other frightening weapons its plutonium is still part of nuclear payloads, waiting for an opportunity for the next big war. This is Chris Rankin with Vanadium. Thank you very much.